Hello, everyone. I am Douglas Saltis, Editor-in-Chief of Betakit, and I haven't had a professional haircut in 10 months. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Did you know that there is a global gap of 3.5 million cybersecurity jobs that need to be filled by 2021? That is a 3x increase from the 1 million positions that needed to be filled as of 2014. So there is a huge opportunity for cybersecurity around the world. Why is it then that of the top 200 managed cybersecurity providers, only five or six are in Canada? The question that we want to answer today is how do we build an ecosystem of cybersecurity startups in Canada? Uh, with me, I have a great group of panelists that I'm happy to introduce right now, and then we're going to dig right into the conversation. So first up, we have Kevin McGee, Chief Security and Compliance Officer at Microsoft Canada. We have Christopher Salvatore, the Manager of Accelerator Programs at the Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst at Ryerson University. And then Tassin Shabab, Co-Founder and CEO at Penfield.ai. And if you're paying attention, you'll see that we have people who are involved in making this ecosystem happen. We have um, enterprises with a vested interest in this ecosystem. And then I think when we get to it, a uh, personal interest in, in mentoring this ecosystem. And then we have some entrepreneurs uh, building cybersecurity startups. Um, so we're gonna dig right into it. Before I get to my first question, I want you to know that um, the questions we'll be answering today won't just be mine. You have the opportunity to ask a question yourself, whether you're watching this on Twitter or Facebook, just leave a um, question in the comments of the stream. And then uh, Stefan from Betakit will send that to me. And then uh, we will look for great opportunities to ask those questions to the panelists. Or if we don't get to it in time, because we got a lot to talk about today, uh, we'll maybe uh, ask them to provide commentary. And when we do the wrap up that will be published on betakit.com, we'll include that information. So. Uh, hit us with your questions now, and then we'll hope to get uh, through them um, throughout the stream. But uh, you know, first, I think Christopher, I want to start with you because I, I think even just to tell people what your job is, what your role is, what the uh, Cybersecurity Catalyst is, because I think it's it's the the perfect inflection point to start talking about a cybersecurity ecosystem in Canada. And, and thanks, Douglas, for allowing me to to do just that. So yeah. And in terms of my day-to-day -day aspect of my job being the manager of Cyber Accelerator programs at the Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst, essentially what I'm doing is helping support the commercialization and acceleration of, of startups, such as, you know, one individual today, Tashin Shabab from Penfield AI. In addition to that, the Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst, which was formed in 2018, is an entity, nonprofit entity of Ryerson University, which is essentially we created a national hub for collaboration and, and innovation within the cybersecurity field. So not only are we doing the pillar of commercial acceleration, but we're also delivering programming in the form of training. And some of that you mentioned today in terms of the unemployment gap. And we're doing this specifically uh, to, to upscale women, displaced workers and new to Canada uh, individuals to get into the field of cybersecurity. Uh, the minimum requirements for it is, is, is a high school diploma and no technical background is needed. And, and our goal is to graduate approximately 800 students in four years. In addition to that, we're also doing support for applied uh, research and development. And lastly, some public education and policy development. A uh, number of partners have been able to, to fund this organization, Rogers being one, RPC, the government of Canada, and we will be housed when things, I guess, go back to normal in the city of Brampton as well. Gotcha. And I think we're um, later on, we're going to be talking about the role that Brampton has been playing in trying to build uh, a hub of cybersecurity talent. But going back to those numbers, so we're talking, you know, 800 skilled workers in four years, that is a drop in the bucket compared to the dramatic global need and uh, the the national Canadian need. Can you also just talk about the the number of, you know, you gave Tassina a shout out, which is good because he's on the panel with us, but the number of companies that you're trying to move through your program and maybe how many you're able to currently support? Because I think, I think that'll be a, a great way for us to get to this conversation of maybe the gaps that we're seeing in in the ecosystem, in, in building an ecosystem and connecting people. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and thanks for that. So this specific pillar of commercial acceleration to support companies with the federal government, we're going to be supporting 60 companies in four years, uh, approximately 15 a year. Our first inaugural cohort, which Sheen is a part of, which launched virtually, uh, we brought in five from across from across the country. Okay, so five, which is um, a healthy amount, but nowhere near kind of what, what we need here. Um, so I think maybe going to uh, Kevin now, um, I, I really want to get your input in here because you, um, with your experience, and I'd like you to speak to that a bit, I think you have an interesting perspective, not only in your role at Microsoft Canada, but as a kind of a member of the um, kind of like Canadian tech and startup ecosystem, but then also someone who has an understanding of some of these gaps in connecting large enterprises um, and startups who are trying to build these services. So do we, and this is something that we talked about on our, our pre-call before, I kind of want to just give you the mic and let you go a bit in terms of the some of the gaps that you're seeing preventing an ecosystem, a community of startups from growing. I think the challenges really haven't changed. I mean, I had a startup in the 90s. I um, have been very involved in the startup. Um, ecosystem throughout Ontario and Canada for my entire career um, and seen many iterations and evolutions, but it's always ha come back to the same challenges. One, we don't seem to grow uh, startups to full-fledged companies in Canada. You know, why is that? Um, we tend to sell to the U.S. We, we tend to become a feature of someone else's product and whatnot. And we have such talented individual folks in this country. It's it's just a shame that we don't we don't further that. So that's always been a challenge. I'm, I'm sure you, your audience, I'm not, I'm not telling them anything they don't know. Um, having mm -hmm. flipped back and forth between the corporate world and, and the startup world, it really amazed me. And when I started helping uh, Ryerson look at recruiting um, startups for the accelerator. And I looked at the data on LinkedIn and Twitter, and this isn't a scientific um, uh, sort of experiment, but I was shocked to see how there's this cloud of corporate contacts and there's this cloud of startup uh, contacts and there was very little um, connection between the two groups and so I started asking you know folks about that do you know about these startups in the corporate world or do you know what's happening the answer was no and then in the startup space do you do you have any context do you do you realize what resources are available that large companies have that you could leverage the answer was no so that really um, you know brought to mind what you know what we could be doing to to bridge those gaps. And it's not just a matter of making programs available and marketing, it's doing this. Uh, so when we contacted you to really, uh, to you know, to do an interview segment, I thought what better way to showcase that than to bring along my partners mm -hmm. uh, in solving this this challenge to really have a deep discussion to start, to start figuring some of this out together. Yeah, and I think that's a really important thing to note. I think most, uh, we certainly see this all the time covering on a beta kit. Uh, it's also been my personal experience working at you know, large tech organizations uh, prior to BetaKit, the there is a gap, there is a disconnect between the enterprise and the the kind of scrappy ecosystem and startup. Now, depending upon what vertical you're in, um, the disparity or the gap could be significant or or minor. Um, can you talk about the imports? And I, I would like to get Christopher in on this as well about when it comes to cybersecurity, how how um, how important it is to have that connect connectivity and and the the real need there to kind of build those partnerships because it's not necessarily something that um, if we're talking about like consumer uh, B two C apps that are like you know photo sharing apps or things like that are are concerned about as much as specific companies in this vertical. And we're very focused at Microsoft and always have been right back to the core of the company on, on building a platform for others to add value, either it's value at resellers or to, to innovate. And, and in the 90s, I started my business based on the BizSpark program, which gave you some free CDs of, mm -hmm. of technology. So there's a long history of there. And every time my team, you know, we look at something and start to sound too corporate -y, I pull up that picture of, uh, you know, the founders of Microsoft with the long hair back in the day and whatnot and remind them, hey, that's where we, we got started as well, too. So I think there's 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 that element that you know I really want to um, to infuse in, in all the discussions, but what I'm seeing is working with a lot of the entrepreneurs and the startups. There's a chance to say, hey, we we see eight trillion signals a day of threat intel. 
you know, we're doing a ton with that, building products and solutions with that, but what else could you do with it? And it's interesting to then let the entrepreneur's mind be unleashed on those resources and to see what mm. they can do with it. So we're not only interested in having uh, that ecosystem built out, we're, we're actively doing everything possible to encourage it. And Tashin's a great example, looking at how, uh, you know, we can use our threat intel, our signals, and our platform of Sentinel and uh, really increase the productivity of people in the SOC. Um, things that we had never thought of before. In fact, I think our first yeah. meeting with Tashi and I said, you know, boy, I wish I had thought of that. It seems so obvious in the the onset, but that's a great entrepreneurial idea when in when you see something like that. Okay, that's a great transition. We're talking about the kind of the mind of the entrepreneur. We have a well, I'm entrepreneur right here in Tashin. And I think, you know, uh, again, we talked about this again um, in our prep for this conversation about you had a bit of an interesting um, uh, hit work history kind of leading you to this point where you're running a uh, cybersecurity startup. I, I even uh, saw uh, you had also worked for a gaming company back in the day, which uh, makes me feel happy because I got my start in tech in gaming. Um, do you want to just maybe articulate your, your road to uh, Penfield and then maybe tie that to some of the things that Kevin is talking about and like what, what it is from your perspective? Because Kevin's arguing for the need to, in the corporate space, to remember their roots but you're, you're the roots, right? Going into these boardrooms, talking to these people. So I'm very much interested in your perspective of how that conversation usually goes. Well, Doc, firstly, thank you for having me here. Um, so uh, so in our case, so from my standpoint, I graduated from the University of Waterloo in electrical engineering. Um, Waterloo being a core program, I worked for three startups uh, while uh, even before I graduated from school. And after that, I um, Work for a gaming company, um, so a startup. It was um, just nine of us, and we built a game which went to second in iOS charts within uh, three months, which was an exciting uh, transition. But then uh, I also joined uh, you know, uh, IBM and, and joined their cybersecurity division. Um, that's something I was always mm -hmm. passionate about. I focused on cybersecurity in school as well. Uh, so this was this was in early 2014, and um, I, I was a, a lead developer of an application security tool, which was uh, successful. And then I started doing consulting for some very large organizations. Um, later, I left uh, the uh, IBM and then I started doing my own consulting for a large bank and then saved up some capital and started doing research on this project with uh, a number of professors from Waterloo. And now we are here. Okay, that's, that's great because I think it articulates a bunch of things in terms of one, you had a bit of work experience in this space Two, you had somewhat of a, a network for connectivity um, the, to enable you. That's not something that we expect most founders uh, across verticals in, in Canada to kind of require to get in there. And um, maybe I'll go. I'll go back to Kevin here, and then we'll get Christopher in because there was something that that um, struck me when we talked before in in in, in kind of building this uh, new generation of entrepreneurs, building this ecosystem. And you were talking about. The idea that it's the commercialization of super intelligent, well-educated people, <laughs> like the like this specific group, uh, like Avengers Assemble style, um, and I, I just want you to share your perspective of maybe some of the barriers they're facing in in getting that, because obviously we're going to talk about the cybersecurity catalyst and the mentorship and the training and 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 what that can provide, but like I feel that the scene has a leg up. Uh, over other founders who might want to get into this space but didn't necessarily have the access or the relationships. Am I, am I accurate in that? Yeah, I think um, in our greatest natural resource really is intelligence. You know, I, uh, anyone who says this, this generation coming up and that they're going to take over the leadership roles is uh, lazy or, you know, is, you know, doesn't get it. They should meet some of the young people that I, I work with in these programs um, because it, it'll blow your mind, you know, just how incredible the ideas they're coming up with, how hard they work mm -hmm. and how innovative they are. Uh, the big challenges are a few things. One, you know, um, they're often academics or engineers. They, they're struggling to learn the, the, uh, the tools and the talents of, of entrepreneurship. So I often get pitched a master's thesis when, you know, I really need, I need a soundbite, I need a tweet. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. a lot of the challenges are around, you know, really boiling that down, communications, 
um, you know, marketing, sales, and whatnot. And I think connecting those skill sets has always been a challenge. You know, going back right uh, to the earliest days of uh, our my startup ecosystem career, where there was a lot of uh, folks um, that were business people and technology people. How how to bring them together was always the the challenge. So. When I find I go into mentoring sessions, it's not really about you know the technology or my my perspective from a cybersecurity professionalist or a technologist that they need help with. It's how to build a revenue model. How do I you know go to market? How do I mm. tell my story? Is some of the big challenges, uh, and we have that talent in Canada. It seems to be just disconnected, and I often feel like one of my my best roles is to bring together um, you know to make make some of this uh, magic happen. Yeah, you know, you had mentioned kind of um, uh, a couple of Toronto ecosystem events on our on our prep call that no longer exist. I guess there aren't that many events happening in 2020, but like local community driven um, events that were just people showing up, demoing products, getting connected, sharing ideas, and that doesn't seem to be the case in this space. Justine, so something you had said before really stuck with me. Um, it bounces off what Kevin's saying is that how academic this space is, which I think is a virtue because we're talking about cybersecurity, one, right? <laughs> Important. Um, but how that doesn't necessarily lead to a culture of, you know, sharing information, connecting and building community, that there might be some, um, some barriers to that openness that you would find in other, um, other parts of kind of Canada's entrepreneurship ecosystem. That's a great uh, question, Doug. So uh, when we look at cyber, the cybersecurity industry, I mean, the cybersecurity professionals have been working under the shadows for the longest time. So these days we're getting a lot of exp uh, like exposure to the, the public. Mm -hmm. So in, in essence, we were always, I find the industry has been, was very close. We won't share information across the board, A, because we deal with highly sensitive information. Um, and B, um, um, the, the, we don't usually, I mean, we are we have been yeah it's just uh, yeah I, I feel that the cybersecurity has always been a close knit industry but now we're moving more for a um, the, but now the industry is opening up in in which case um, partnering with um, large organizations such as uh, Microsoft um, can be uh, it's not uh, very easy but nowadays thanks to the Catalyst program it's uh, uh, th these are things which are getting more open. Okay, I swear we're going to get to Christopher. We're basically teeing up to basically explain how this program works. But I want to ask you uh, one follow up to scene, and that is like beyond the difficulty of of getting connected, maybe sharing, and obviously like you know the privacy considerations, the security, proprietary um, processes, and IP like is an important uh, consideration. But did you ever feel excluded or frozen out, or maybe like you didn't have? um a path to either participate in some of the startup events that everyone else seems to go to and celebrate or that there wasn't the right kind of event for for you and the company that you were trying to build i think that the cyber the way in which uh, i think the cybersecurity industry and building a cybersecurity company is a, a little bit different than uh, many other uh, com companies um in in which case um it's, it, uh, nowadays, there are a lot of uh, like um, um, like conferences, but uh, again, I think the way in which we the challenges we face are very different. For instance, a, uh, what we build in lab environment might not really transcend to uh, reality. So, the, who is going to understand yeah. those problems? It's usually the folks who are within the industry. So, how can we get get to those folks? How can we get access to data so that we can validate um, the the products we are building and see? How do we transition from a research company to uh, more of a, a viable business? And these are our, the challenges we face are very unique from that of uh, uh, most many startups. Yeah, it's your you know commercialization is something we've touched upon, super accurate, but it's not quite a pizza and beer demo day scenario. So okay, now let's I've been I've been saying we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Let's go to Chris for now. Talk about the program and then how something like the Cybersecurity Catalyst works to overcome these these barriers or or uh, put companies in the right position to have these conversations because like if, if it isn't obvious here you know like kevin is a mentor for to startup which is great because you know kevin's got a lot of opinions ideas support he can provide that connection to a broader ecosystem but he also works at microsoft which is of value right so so talk about that kind of matchmaking component and and what needs to happen in um, the program to create 
that catalyst? Yeah, and, and, and another another great question. And I think you're going to hear this theme today in terms of, of partnerships, right? And I think when, when you think of our ecosystem from a Canadian lens to, to maintain that catalyst, that leadership position, a number of things need to be done in collaboration with individuals such as, as Kevin from Microsoft and in academic institutions as well. And in addition to public sector partners is exactly where the catalyst sits in between and supporting companies uh, like Tashin. So we have a number of individuals like Kevin from a corporate standpoint that are giving back their time that are teaching um, that business context that Kevin was mentioning early in terms of building out cyber entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. which is something that's lagging right now. In addition to that, the program is also designed with a number of entrepreneurs and residents that anything from if Tashin needs go to market help to raising capital, there's really that education aspect to it, that connection aspect to it. And I think that's what we need in terms of helping support startup and cyber individuals with, with their ideas. Yeah, because this isn't necessarily something that they can rapidly iterate on their own and do a couple unbounced landing page experiments to get their first 50 users. This is like some really integrated processes selling to, to large enterprise organizations. And that, that takes experience and some work. So I'm going to want to throw back to Kevin and maybe we're going to blow up uh, to see spot a little bit and talk about the types of things that maybe you've mentored his company on, or maybe we can go agnostic and say generally companies like we always talk, we already talked about the sales component and, you know, the need to kind of summarize your product, not your idea, not your technology, but what you're selling into a tweet rather than showing up with a master's thesis and expecting it paid. What are the other kind of um, barriers you see early stage cybersecurity entrepreneurs running up against that they kind of need guidance on? I, like, just like, let's share all the deets. We, Cause there might be someone listening to this right now who sees themselves in uh, to scene and are like, please, <laughs> we need, we need, we need some help here. Well, I think back, you know, to my career, security has always been those, uh, you know, the, the, IT has always been sort of in the basement of the dungeon. Security is in the level below them, so we haven't really been the hot, uh, the hot um, part of the, the industry sector for a long time. And then, as she mentioned, we, all of a sudden we became really uh, exciting and got a lot of attention. So, but it's also an industry that you know, if we're successful and we do our job right, and your product works, you obviously you sometimes can't tell anyone. Um, so it is a non-traditional uh, type of organization. So if your product's really working and being really successful, you can't tout it. You know those, those demo days, or you can't you can't uh, market and advertise. So it, it can be difficult. The, also, the the type of person attracted to uh, cybersecurity, you know, is is rumored to be sort of that just. Um, um, computer science uh, type background and that's not the case at all i have a history degree you know i think we really need to yeah. encourage diversity in teams we you know we need folks that can communicate super well in the written uh, format who can write those marketing proposals we need finance people we need uh liberal arts we need all of these different uh, backgrounds and diversity because it makes a stronger product makes a more innovative team mm -hmm. and just you know really ultimately increases your chance of being successful when i talk to CISOs of major banks or whatnot ask them what their biggest concern of is they tell me ransomware yeah i don't see any you know, criminologists on their on their teams you know so that mm -hmm. diversity of thought really makes a difference uh, so diversify your team is number one. First of all, you probably, if you built it in the dorm room kind of thing, the old adage, you might have a number of people that think and act like you. You've got to bring people on your team that have different points of view, different backgrounds, different uh, perspectives uh, to really start to flush out these ideas and and uh, and develop that. And then build out a, a mentor ecosystem uh, to do the same with, with an advisory board or informal mentorship or whatnot. But uh, sort of recognizing that, you know, if you all think and talk the same, you know, it won't be successful without bringing in that larger ecosystem of uh, perspectives and expertise. Yeah, it's so interesting in a conversation about cybersecurity startups, we're talking about the need for uh, STEAM and not STEM and those varied perspectives, but it's super important. And, you know, as someone who has a uh, humanities degree, not a technical degree, but has spent his entire year a career working in tech in some way, right? I think that's super important. Uh, it actually relates to one question that we had submitted that I think is, is really interesting as a follow-up. 
Um, because I think the point is well taken about the need to overlap and connect. But I, I, I think um, uh, we're talking about how do, how do we get people like to see <laughs> meeting the right people? Um, but there, there's another way of doing it and, and getting those right people connected with those early stage startups. So the question that we had posed was, how can non-tech people get connected with these um, cyber security startups? You know, um, if, there's a, if there's a desperate need for the non-tech and the business connections, it seems like there isn't a really good format for that, that middle ground. Um, you know, it seems like the meetup groups, the conversations, the spaces for this connectivity are either highly technical, which is either scary uh, or boring or potentially off-putting, or they're more like networking kind of markety things. Like, and, and I'll pose this question to everyone. Is there, is there a gap in the type of space or events to, to get these people connected or are we not approaching it in the right way? I can just start with that. Uh, I and I think you you and I talked about the old demo camps, and I'll give a shout out to David yeah. Crow, who used to run demo camps back in the day. No PowerPoint, just demo, and they were in you know a bar or whatnot, and they grew in in popularity or whatnot. But you know you got to show your your product, your solution to the crowd, and got immediate feedback, and everyone was mm -hmm. there to help each other and 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 be successful. And I think we've sort of gotten away from that, uh, which is a challenge. So creating that startup ecosystem for cybersecurity is is going to be key and, and it does have different needs and, and maybe needs to come up with a, a different means of connection there are the technical mm -hmm. groups and whatnot i think if you want to join the ecosystem my advice is and, and this is starting your career in, in cybersecurity as well learn the industry not just the um not just the technical you got to learn the culture you know you got to know who mm -hmm. the the major hackers are you got to read the cool books um there's the cybersecurity canon which i love it here's all the books that are sort of the the rock and roll hall of fame of uh, cybersecurity books you got to know who Neil how many Stevenson neil stevenson is. yeah okay <laughs> I, was just, um, I i hopefully on the live stream people heard us say neil stevenson's yeah. name at the exact same time um but uh yeah that is i think that is one author which is a really great example yeah. if you don't know who neil stevenson is um when when you talk about something like uh oculus the people building oculus um are using a book called Snow Crash, written by Neil Stevenson in 1994, to visualize and, and build the virtual spaces that he's conceived. Cryptonomicon is another great example. Uh, uh, yeah. So, this, but again, that's a that's a, where a I build my community around. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Love so a book, so stuff, I would. More fun nerd stuff. Yeah, I would publish what book I was reading on, you know, LinkedIn or Twitter or whatnot, and it's amazing how many people would, you know, say, "Hey, I'm reading that too. Is it a good book?" And really, I started to build a, a whole community around my love of reading, my my love of, of cybersecurity culture. We would talk about the uh, the movies, you know, hackers, or you know, were you a swordfish or were you a sneakers fan, and and why or why not? Um, and I always like to uh, with the really. Um, you know, the mil real military type cyber folks say, you know, who's your favorite cybersecurity author and why is it Neil Stevenson? Because it provokes them. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, just have, you can build, you know, community around the cultural aspects of our industry because it's an industry founded around ingenuity, around solving problems. The original word hacker, you know, in the day was taking apart things to see how they work and then showing others how to do it or improve it. And mm -hmm. uh, that still exists as, as uh, an underpinning of our culture. So embrace the culture. Uh, if you're a, a humanities for, uh, person or a history person, lean in on that, you know, study the history. You know, that's a great way to have a, start a conversation. And that's what I did. And that's how I've made a lot of my deepest and, and best relationships in their industry is around either debating or discussing uh, some of our favorite books. Okay. So Christopher, I'm going to look to you now and not ask you about your favorite books, but then how a program <laughs> like yours can help facilitate that. Like, obviously you're connected um, to Ryerson University. We know the work that they've done to be, build spaces, not only in Toronto, but like throughout Ontario. And if you read our reporting, maybe in other provinces to, to connect innovators, academia um, and enterprise, like do you, is it your responsibility and your job to create a space where people like to see and are showing up and talking about like snow crash or, or, or books of that like, or like maybe having conversations that aren't about just selling to enterprise. And, and that's how the, the program is designed to that point, Douglas, like these founders come in, they don't, they don't sell to Kevin. Kevin, Kevin is a mentor to them as it relates to, um, 
helping them on the next steps of their of their business. I, I just wanted to kind of also touch on, on on the culture aspect as well. What what I've noticed being being new to the industry as well, coming from banking, is that if there is someone that has an idea as it relates to cyber, the the goodwill nature of the cyber ecosystem, especially within the Canadian landscape, is phenomenal. And with the catalyst, if, if you haven't had a chance to check us out on LinkedIn or, or, or Twitter, a number of these um, connections are established there. So I don't kind of diverge from your initial question, but um, that is my day to day is that to, to encourage people to, to ask those questions and to pose those ideas. I'm speaking to companies and individual founders that aren't necessarily even incorporated to, um, to, to support them because the, the ecosystem is quite small right now. Yeah. And then, so, you know, obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic right now. So how are you looking to do that remotely? Is that an advantage for you where instead of trying to, to draw people to Toronto, to the GTA, you're maybe connecting more remotely. There's convert. I just basically consider this just a hangouts call with some people in my ecosystem where we're talking about stuff we're interested in. Like it got to Neil Stevenson. That's basically what I just do in my, my personal time. But are, are you trying to facilitate more remote connections and take advantage of the fact that we can't be together in person right now? Definitely. It has, it has it helped in terms of the recruitment from across the country? Yes. Um, the intention is when things get back to the new normal is to, and then we're going to talk about this, is build up that Brampton, Brampton Innovation District, whether that's mm -hmm. starting an organization or a company within Brampton or hiring a sales representative from a from a company such as Tashines within Brampton, but it has helped out a lot in terms of adapting to the new norm. Okay. So seeing we, we kind of, it's, it's interesting, right? Cause we're, we're talking about you, you are the avatar for all cybersecurity entrepreneurs right now mm -hmm. on this, in this conversation. So I want, I won't give you more time to speak to this and maybe let's first start and, and talk about what you felt like you've learned in the program. Um, what or you know even just the simple things like what were the obvious things that maybe kind of like knocked you right on the head that you know in retrospect now seem so obvious but were really important for your company to learn and grow and scale because i i, I want to i want um founders who are like you or want to become like you to kind of maybe uh expedite <laughs> their education process and get some tips from you to, to to smooth that out so what when you go into the program and you're speaking with mentors at Microsoft or any, any of the other large partner um, organizations connected with cybersecurity catalysts, like what, what was, what was changing your mind as part of that? Well, thank you, Doug. Um, so the Rogers uh, cyber catalyst program has been instrumental in, uh, in the course of Penfield. Uh, we're, so we're transitioning from a research based company to a viable business. And, and this is where mm -hmm. Rogers uh, cyber catalyst fit in. For instance, Kevin, we've learned a lot from all of our EIRs as well as corporate, uh, the partners at the Catalyst program. So Kevin has been instrumental in op optimizing our approach to sales. So when we were when we were a more research company, the, the th things we would demonstrate were quite different than uh, than what we are currently doing now. Uh, so right now, it's a mm -hmm. lot more our sales approach is a lot more polished and geared towards our respective uh, target audience. So that's uh, just one of the things which we have uh, learned from the Catalyst program. In addition, I think what's very unique about the Catalyst program is the combination of uh, entrepreneurs and residents who coach us on a weekly basis with the exceptional mm -hmm. corporate partners. So in which case we find a lot of network effects where we learn something from the corporate partners and then we further refine that with uh, on our entrepreneurs and residents. And also this enables us to better target the companies we are pushing uh, to, to drive our sales. Okay, because I, I was going to ask if this is kind of an upfront educational thing or an always on where, you know, maybe they're giving you advice and you're checking back in occasionally to see how that's being implemented as you make the transition from uh, a research company to, I guess, a product company, right? Yeah. So in our case, it's very, I would say it's very targeted. So I can give one example. So for instance, we're current, uh, so so recently we, so we're, um, currently in the post, uh, sales uh, process with a number of large enterprise customers. So one one thing we realized was, say, in the, say there's, so during the sales process, there's a phase called the architecture uh, review. 
uh, where previously our notion was we're supposed to explain the architecture of our product, but then as we circle back with our EIRs and corporate partners, we realize it's just a matter of aligning the capabilities of our product with that of the end customer so that they can understand that and align that with the five-year vision of the enterprise uh, company. So these are things we would have not realized if we didn't have this exposure with the entrepreneurs in residence, as well as the corporate partners at, in, in, at Rogers Catalyst. And we, were, we might have completely blown that up one opportunity. Uh, so this is just one of the things which uh, the Catalyst program has been highly uh, beneficial for. Okay, that that's awesome. So it's not about... Um telling your potential customers all the things that you can do. It's making sure you lead with what you know <laughs> they want of you so they'll they'll close that deal. Okay, I think that's, so it, that's, it's, that's a good lesson. It's more, about, it's more about aligning our definition with that of the, the end uh, customer because they might be considering our product in a different manner because they're looking at their mm -hmm. five-year pipeline. So it's still the same value. It's just how how, how are we aligning our story uh, with that in a way, in a way the customer would better uh, and appreciate and, and okay. absorb. That makes sense. I want to go back to, we've got another submitted question and I thought this was very interesting because again, we're talking about um, the, the value of partnerships, the need to connect startups and enterprise together, hopefully towards building a community where we're all just like in a really big um, uh, book club, a weekly book club together. Uh, but one question that we got, and this really resonates with me, maybe not necessarily in the cybersecurity space, but in other verticals we cover where corporate partnerships are so important. I think FinTech is a great example. Uh, the Startup Genome Report just dropped yesterday naming uh, the Toronto Kitchener-Waterloo region as the number one FinTech hub uh, in the world, which is very interesting. Start, a startup and corporate partnerships are a huge component of that. But the question that we got submitted is that how can startups kind of dance with the elephants in the, the corporate resources world. like, And I, I think this person is asking this question because oftentimes some of the resources, the mentorship, the guidance provided, that connectivity really comes with with strings. So I, I think that maybe the best person to ask with to see is, have you ever experienced situations um, in, the, in the past where you've been trying to work with corporate partners or do any work where you felt like you weren't on an even keel with the relationship or, or that there was something more expected of you than than you realized maybe going into that first meeting. I, I think um, so. So the, so the the especially with the enterprise where the, the sales process is complex, so we have to um, tune our message with different stakeholders within the organization, and different stakeholders might be looking for different things. A, for instance, if you're targeting um, the, the, say a senior executive, but they, they might be looking at the overall KPIs and, and our, our, the return on investment on, of our product. However, if you are to talk with more of the research and the technical folks, they might be looking at different things. For instance, how does your product work? Would it even scale? Mm. Also, if you are to talk with an architect, as I mentioned, they might be looking for alignment. How does your capabilities uh, align with the, with the vision of the, uh, the corporation? So it's still the same product in essence. It's just the alignment and, and using the right language and, and talking and speaking at the right levels. And these are some of the things which uh, obviously going through uh, the Catalyst program, uh, we have been uh, learning and optimizing. Okay, I gotta. I have to throw back to Kevin for that because I want to throw this from the from the other way. And now we're gonna have, uh, you know, Kevin represent all enterprise, um, <laughs> and and say, you know, from my experience working with corporate partners, it's always been one of finding. It's not about the you know, you know people see companies as these monoliths, these box, but it's actually a bunch of small teams all across the world working on their specific focus that then have to communicate with each other. And it's so important to find the right advocates internally that not only are the, the, the advocates that believe in you and what you're doing, uh, but then also have the capacity, the bandwidth, the interest to kind of enact that relationship on their side so something tangible happens. Kevin, can you speak to that? Because I know we're even just having like a, a, you know, I won't disclose it, but just like a fun little uh, Twitter conversation in DMs yesterday. And I think it resonates like, how, how do you recommend to startups to find the right and identify the right advocates internally at these organizations so that they know they're not spending six months. We got this great relationship with company X and then it turns out that's not even the right division to talk to you. It's not the right person. It's expectations and how we see each other. I think that's the challenge. We both um, perceive the situation a little differently. So uh, what, uh, what I mean by that is 
we uh, I get approached all the time. So I look at my LinkedIn mm -hmm. inbox right now uh, or my email. It's going to be 20, 30 outreaches from startups that want to start a conversation with me. And here's what it's going to be. Hi, we've got this product that solves this problem and, and it's going to be a generic, you know, pitch. I, mm -hmm. And I could literally, you know, do a um, substitution program to substitute name pitch. Like there's only so many permutations of this. I've seen them all. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, reaching out to me like that is going to either get you deleted or sent to our partner organization who's going to look at you as, okay, how do I make you into a Microsoft, you know, strategic generic partner, yeah. which is not what you probably are or want to be. So why startups do this? I have no idea. Startups are always trying to present themselves like this massive company. We've got all this, you know, big building that stock art, you know, photo of, you know, very, you know, really you know, big offices and whatnot, but that's not who you are. Mm -hmm. Stop trying to present yourself, you know, in general and as well to corporate America like that right? Because that's not what you, who you are. And when you present that way, that's how you're going to be perceived. It's breaking the pattern. And this goes back to sort of, you know, the, you know, the attack kill chain uh, approach of um, building products as well too. Um, break mm -hmm. the pattern of uh, how you engage with us. What I want to see when I, I hear from a startup is uh, we're a startup, you know, we're, we're four people really smart in a basement and we're building this cool product and we would just like you to, you know, your thoughts on it, or could you have a look at it and tell us what you think? Or or, you know, could you connect us with someone who could give us some expertise in this? Be very clear on what your ask is. I don't want to do a demo. I don't want to have coffee with you. You know, I don't want to I'll have all those generic things, you, you know, that sound like everyone else. Give me something of interest. Give me something that, you know, I can help. Most people want to help others. When I put out mm -hmm. the call, we had a university that contacted us that wanted to do some mentoring calls and they wanted five, 10 people. I got 40 responses within uh, Microsoft of saying, I'll do that. And yeah. actually they're way oversubscribed. It's sometimes we just don't connect and we don't misinterpret each other's circles, uh, signals. So when you reach out, put it up right up front while you're reaching out. I, I need help in this particular thing. Be very clear on what the ask is and why you're contacting that person and how they can help. Someone helped me, someone helped you, someone helped everyone to, you know, at any point in their career, uh, but you just have to ask. Again, if you put on that facade, we will misinterpret that message. Be just be yourself and be very crystal clear. Um, because again, everyone, you know, at a big company or at least most want to help. They just don't know how and they don't know how to engage and they don't know how to recognize that conversation when they see it. Uh, so make it easy for them. Um, and and I'll be, I'd be surprised if you didn't get a positive response. Yeah, I think, you know, we deal with this all the time when we're getting pitched stories at Beta Kit, but it's also something when I was at a brim and blackberry i always it always just amazed me the extent to which people would treat me as a representation of the whole company they would they would treat me as like one point in the monolith rather than like the person focused on my specific tasks as if i was like you know kevin i just got my um my new xbox but the batteries that came with the controller don't work. I'm going to tweet him about it because it's like if if you if you treat the people at these enterprises not as the individuals that they are, you're you're gonna you're gonna bounce off of them in the way that you think um, like they might not have time and attention for you. So I, I think that's I think that's great advice um, and and really important to see from the other side and the other lens of who you're trying to connect with. I want to go now because we're, um, we're we're nearing the end of this. Uh, we had one more section I want to talk with and it's the positive stuff, right? So we've identified, you know, the the lack of a real ecosystem, you know, the need to build partnerships and these kind of communication issues. I think a lot of these are solved by building community, which right now is um, digitally enabled. But we do have Christopher here who's actually building, <laughs> you know, a place where this can happen. And I want to I want to throw to you now because one of the questions that I had to ask was actually asked by us on the panel uh, or, or through uh, commenters uh, to the panel uh, about how how we accelerate this community building is and their question is is the nonprofit or government sector the way to accelerate this? Would the private sector public private partnerships do better to go from the, you know, 800 people to the 3.5 million needed. And I, I think it's really interesting to get your perspective because not only like, obviously it's the Rogers cybersecurity catalyst, you're at uh, Ryerson University, which has, you know, provincial funding, but particular to um, the work that you're doing in the city of Brampton, that comes with uh, government support for fed dev commitments uh, through talent and training. So you're, you're kind of doing all of them, right? 
the, the catalyst was set up as a platform to, to hit on two things exactly that you mentioned was talent development and, and creating cyber companies. And I think there is no one partner, whether it's just specifically private, specifically public, it's a combination of both and, and academia as well. In terms of, I always relate it to three pillars, education, uh, connection, and then you're going to hear it over the, you know, at the end of this core, inspiring founding stories, founder stories from individuals like Tashin to kind of build that buzz for the ecosystem. So are we there yet? No, absolutely not. It, it will be a, a long road ahead, but I think in terms of maintaining our position in terms of cyber investment, it needs to be a combination of all three of those that we've mentioned, public, private, and academia. Okay. And now it, I, the one follow-up I want to ask to that is, is maybe what comes first. Is it the event from Ryerson, which has like this history of just, you know, creating these innovation sectors and hubs throughout Ontario to support and not just we're talking downtown Toronto, but ex extended across the province and potentially nationally. Is it, is it the municipal support and interest to say like, Hey, we want, we want high skilled workers here first and we will create space um, to build it. We've, we've written on Beta Kit about Innisfil trying to build their own uh, hub locally. I think if you talk to some people at Communitech, they'll say that Kitchener Waterloo actually is the cybersecurity hub uh, of Canada, which is kind of news to me a little bit. Um, what, what, what gets the ball rolling to make this happen? It definitely is a combination of, of, of three. Brampton uh, being one of our funding partners exactly from a municipal uh, standpoint is creating this entire innovation district. We are not only there, the Brampton uh, Entrepreneurship Center is there, and Ryerson as well will have the, the, the business innovation zone as well, which will actually be placed and all of this. So I think to your initial question, it definitely starts at the municipal municipal uh, level. Okay, that's awesome. I mean, I'm maybe to, to close this off, then uh, we can go back to Kevin. And I'm, I'm wondering if you're willing, sir, uh, to throw down the gauntlet and maybe challenge some other enterprises uh, in Canada operating who have not dipped their toes in this in these waters. Some of those people that are uh, your LinkedIn connections that are not connected to the ecosystem right now to, to help them get involved. And maybe I, I won't ask um, Christopher to make the pitch for him, but like maybe you can make the pitch on behalf of the, the, the catalyst as, as to why you're involved and why they should also be involved. I think I'd rather encourage than challenge. Um, I think that sets okay. the right tone <laughs> with our competitors. But um, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're all defenders in this industry. We're all really looking to protect people, and we do that by working together. Like that's the that's the core of why folks get into cybersecurity. Is it's yes, the problem solving and whatnot, but ultimately, you know we're designing solutions or, you know, building businesses that will, will protect people from harm. Uh, Microsoft's mm -hmm. uh, mission is, is to empower, you know, every person and individual on the planet. We're very committed to that. Uh, we, we take a growth mindset to whatever, you know, we, we uh, put our minds to and whatnot. And we are encouraged by our CEO, Sachin Dow, to use the company as a platform to achieve our, our personal ambitions and whatnot. So that's one of the reasons I'm at Microsoft is I, I'm a believer in, in, uh, in that aspect of it. But what I like to see more at the corporate level is, you know, really going back to that mission, going back to that core value, which is we're in this to, you know, defend people. We're in this to form from the bad guys, from cyber criminals, from nation state actors that either will do us direct harm or indirect harm. And, uh, you know, we have an obligation uh, to, to those people to protect them. Um, and it's very satisfying when we can do that job. That's that's part of why we do this work. So go back to the mission, you know, uh, is the mission accomplished, you know, all working on our own, or is it better accomplished coming together? And we have a partnership uh, called the MISA partnership where Microsoft is actually working, making our threat intel, making our tools available to who would normally be our competitors in this space because it's the right thing to do. Um, and uh, we're seeing more and more companies uh, sort of adopt that approach and and really, and, you know, see the, the, the you know, the basic uh, mission uh, as the, the primary motivator, not necessarily market share or whatnot as well. So that would be what I would encourage our, our competitor folks um, 
our competitors in the space is not to look at Microsoft or each other as competitors, but part of the same ecosystem, part of the same you know, larger defender team. The bad guys are on the outside. You know, that's who we should be. Uh, you know, we should be directing that attention and negativity towards. How do we work together, and how do we break down those barriers? And I am seeing more and more evidence of that. Would love to see more, um, and and how we could better serve our, our customers by doing so. But then also how we can ignite, you know, startups and, and ecosystems by working together. And the the Calus is a great example. You know, we're working with hand in hand and side by side with organizations mm-hmm. that we also compete with. But you know we're there not to promote our businesses, and, and hopefully the, the folks on yeah. the other side of the screen will will um, will attest. Uh, none of us are really there to sell our, our technology or, or push it onto the startups or whatnot. We're there because we, we we care about this ecosystem and we want to do the right thing. Um, and I've been you know really pleased with how not only our organization has showed up, but how some of our traditional competitors have showed up. And I'm very proud of their yeah, you know their contributions to this ecosystem as much as I. As of ours. That's awesome. I I didn't I wasn't even necessarily referencing competitors, just even more mm-hmm. other large corporations in the space maybe aren't as directly mm-hmm. involved. But just that message of it being kind of the right thing to do, particularly this space, I think is a great one to leave off on. We've talked about a lot today. Um, I think it's it's exciting to me that in a time in which we all have to do this remotely, um, one of the big standout lessons is that a lot of the, the solutions to this problem, to this this challenge of servicing this need of building an ecosystem comes from building community. That starts with things that we're doing today. We've got four people on a call. <laughs> we're having this conversation. We've got a lot of people watching, looking to be engaged. One of the questions that we didn't get to was people asking, you know, if, if they're new to this space and they want to learn more, how they can get connected. I have an easy answer for you. It is betakit.com. We're going to be doing uh, a bunch more content around this space. You are now connected uh, to the Roger Cybersecurity Catalyst. You now <laughs> know to scene. You now know Kevin. You know these c- companies. Um, we're going to be doing a wrap up of this conversation on BetaKit later this week. We'll have more stuff coming in the new year. And like, let's start. We we all know each other now. We've got some great book recommendations, and we can just uh, go from there. I want to thank uh, the panelists for staying a little bit longer being a part of this conversation, really coming to BetaKit with, uh, hey, you you should t- be talking about this. BetaKit, you you need to start participating in this community as well. That's, that's something that we love to hear. And um, I hope anyone who had a question today uh, didn't get an answer during the panel. If you're seeing this on the, the, uh, the rebroadcast, post a comment, we'll send it to the panelists. We'll try to get an answer for you for the write-up or, or for the next one, right? Because uh, it starts today, but it continues to tomorrow. So thank you once again to the panelists. Um, I'm Douglas Salta, Editor-in-Chief of Beta Kit. We look forward to seeing you on the next Beta Kit Live. <laughs>